First there was COVID, then there was war. A once-in-a-century crisis followed by a once-in-a-generation crisis. The government stepped in to help with the first, but how much will it do now as the cost of living spirals? The Chancellor delivers his mini-budget this week. Is he prepared to do more? Good morning. Russia continues bombarding Ukraine. The consequences have already been huge. And the economic reverberations around the globe are only starting to be felt. I'll be joined by the Chancellor Rishi Sunak as he faces mounting demands to prevent a once-in-a-generation squeeze on living standards. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves will be here. Would Labour be doing more to protect people from soaring energy prices and fuel bills? And the actor Ruth Wilson has been telling me about her return to the stage and her new film about an intense love affair gone wrong. And reviewing the papers this morning, I'm joined by the consumer champion Martin Lewis and by the Sun columnist Jane Moore. But first to the news with Nina Warhurst. Sophie, thank you. The president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, has called Russia's siege of the city of Mariupol a terror that will be remembered for centuries to come. The southern port city has been under sustained attack for weeks with supplies of food, gas and clean water running out. The UN says at least 840 civilians have been killed in the conflict across Ukraine so far. It comes as more than three million people have now fled the fighting in Ukraine. The UN is warning the situation is creating a child refugee almost every second. Around 600,000 people in England will be invited to book an additional COVID vaccination this week. They're the first to be offered a spring booster, which will be available to over 75s. Care home residents and anyone over 12 considered at high risk from the infection. It comes as the number of COVID cases continues to rise across the UK. And in the Six Nations, there was success for France as they beat England to light up Paris. Their first win in the tournament for more than a decade. And that's it for me. The next news on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Sophie. Nina, thank you. Well, let's start this morning with Ukraine, where it appears Russia is trying to bomb parts of the country into submission. There continues to be intense fighting in Mariupol, which is completely surrounded. A short while ago, I spoke to the Ukrainian MP Halina Yanchenko and asked her if the city could fall. Well, you should understand that the situation is very tense and hard. Uh, Russian occupants have uh, bombed um, about 80 percent of all the buildings in the city. And we are talking about big city. We are talking about city with about um, half a million inhabitants living uh, there before Russian invasion. So about 80 percent of all the buildings are ruined. People are trying to find shelters in any other kind of buildings, uh, including theater, which was also recently bombed, as you as you might know. Uh, they're trying to find some shelters in schools, in hospitals, even in churches. But we see that even this kind of uh, buildings are being attacked by Russians who have nothing sacred. As you say, the theater was bombed a few days ago and there are a lot of people trapped still. Have you made any progress in rescuing them? Yesterday, about uh, 130 people were rescued uh, from, from the uh, theater. Also, uh, for over a week, we are trying to actually negotiate with Russians a humanitarian corridor. So people who are innocent, who are civilians, who don't uh, like even mean to fight, uh, we are talking about women and children including babies who were born during this, you know, uh, Mariupol blockade. Uh, yesterday and the day before, we managed to rescue a couple of thousand people. They uh, escaped the city and now uh, they are moving toward um, the Parisian and also more uh, Western regions. Is your fear that President Putin will do to other cities in Ukraine what he has done to Mariupol? This is not a fear. This is what they already do. 
Look what they did to Kharkiv. The city was under massive uh, shelling. Look, look to what uh, they did uh, f to Suma, to Chernihiv, and to many other cities in that region. And also to many other satellite cities around uh, Kyiv. There are cities and uh, villages around Kyiv that are totally destroyed. And the thing is, the worst thing is that Putin is not fighting with building. Of course, it makes no sense to you know to hit residential building. It makes no sense to hit to to, to hit uh, schools and uh, kindergartens. Uh, Russian occupation army has started to fight against civilians. They are not people. They are not soldiers. They behave like themselves like I don't know like animals like like devil. And that's what we see. And that's why we desperately asking for more military support from our Western partners. Do you think that the Russians will do to Kyiv what they have done to Mariupol? As of now, uh, I should say that we have some, uh, by we, I mean, uh, Ukrainian army, but also territory defense and those people people who stay in Kyiv to uh, protect the city, uh, they are having some really good um, progress. So uh, Russian um, soldiers are moving um, fr away from uh, Kyiv. Negotiations have been taking place with the Russians. Do you think that those negotiations could ever end in a ceasefire? Uh, well, we hope so, but we see that uh, Russians don't understand diplomatic word. Results in negotiation is by actually showing them that uh, that they will lose uh, this war, they will lose their uh, soldiers, lose their techniques, and they should, you know, uh, be more uh, negotiable, uh, come to uh, more compromises. But for Ukraine, these compromises are pretty clear. Uh, they, uh, Russians should uh, leave our country, they uh, should stop shooting uh, people, and they should uh, actually uh, give our lands back, including Donbass and Crimea. Halina Yanchenko, thank you very much for talking to us this morning. Thank you. That was the Ukrainian MP, Halina Yanchenko, talking to me a short time ago. Let's look now at the front pages of the newspapers this morning and start with the Mail on Sunday, uh, a big interview that they have with the Chancellor. Uh, their headline, Rishi, my mission to slash your tax. And uh, they say it's the strongest hint yet that he could cut fuel duty and income tax later this week. I'll be talking to him about that later on. Uh, the Sunday Telegraph this morning, a terrible photograph there on the front of from Mariupol, the fall of Mariupol imminent, uh, it says, as Russians block access to the sea. And also the main story then, uh, Johnson frustrated with uh, Rishi Sunak over nuclear, it says this is the Prime Minister wanting to increase the number of new reactors, nuclear reactors, to address the growing energy crisis. The Observer's main story is uh, these comments the, uh, that the Prime Minister made yesterday, his claim that Ukraine fighters is like Brexit. This is at the Conservative Spring Conference in Blackpool, something that has uh, drawn a lot of criticism from MPs and politicians both here and abroad. The Sunday Times, do not choose the side of evil, the Prime Minister tells China. Uh, Boris Johnson saying that Xi Jinping having second thoughts on Putin. The Sunday Express, uh, the invincible missile, and Putin unle um, unle unleashes this new missile. We'll be talking about that in a moment, something that he's been using in Ukraine, we think. And the Sunday Mirror, uh, just photographs of some of the many, many children who are uh, affected by this. He can't kill our dreams. These are refugee children defiant as Russia launches its hypersonic missile. And finally, the Sun on Sunday, a very different story there. Maddy Cops to X acts their inquiry. Um, it says that it's closing down its 11-year investigation into the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Well, here to join me, uh, joining me to look at the papers, Martin Lewis, the founder of the Money Saving Expert website and the Sun columnist, Jane Moore. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Um, Jane, let's start with you. And you wanted to talk about <clears throat> this, this missile, which has been featuring in a lot of the papers uh, today and has been, we think, used in Ukraine. Yes. I mean, you know, with this conflict, there's been a lot of sort of armchair generals who've got very kind of in-depth knowledge of military warfare and geopolitics and whatever. But... For the majority of people, you sort of listen to the reports and you, you look for these little sort of ray, glimmers of hope. And last week we were hearing that, that Putin um, was having peace talks with Ukraine and I think everybody kind of went, 
oh, thank goodness for that. It's, you know, the end is in sight. And then suddenly this morning, uh, we wake up to, to the fact that Putin has now launched what it says here, these hypersonic missiles. And this is the first time that these have been used. Um, and what's sort of scary about them is that they can fly. They fly very low. It says here they fly closer to the Earth's surface, so they're not <clears throat> much harder to be detected by ground-based radars. And I, I think for, you know, the ordinary person, this... I mean, even the MOD here say that this is, this is a, a strategy of attrition now and that he's ramping, basically ramping up. And uh, for the ordinary person, I think that is terrifying. Um, for, for any number of reasons, but, you know, particularly because there is a suggestion that not this particular one, but that Putin does have ones that could perhaps reach further, have a, have a further range. I mean, as you say, it's, it's, it says here it's not been verified, but I think you were saying the Americans have... have uh... Well, suggested uh, it, it has actually happened. I mean, the, the thing about these missiles is they go very fast. I mean, that's they Mach five to Mach ten. Yeah, five times faster than the speed of sound, isn't so it? So they could get. They could get. Th that's the point. I mean, ultimately, it is in terms of impact. It, it is a missile like the other missiles that have been fired at Ukraine, and, it, and it's horrendous in that. But it isn't actually any more devastating. It, it's it's a suggestion. You know, it, it's almost is it a posturing point to say we've got these missiles that can go very fast and very far. No one in Europe is safe from these missiles, and you you hope it isn't symbolic of that and a lot of stories obviously again this week uh, terrible human stories yeah, terrible me, human suffering and, and again i think for the majority of people it's just sometimes you you know with war reporting you it, it can just become sort of noise in the end because there's it's just so scary but actually when you read the reports of the people that are involved in these conflicts it's that it's those sort of things that really really bring home to you what's going on um and you know there's a family here where the the father was shot and he had to wait for a, a week to get help and eventually russian soldiers let them back into their flat to get some blankets there were 10 russian officers in their flat sort of going through their personal possessions. They went down to their car thinking maybe we'll get away in our car. There was an 18-year-old boy slumped dead in the passenger seat of their car, who'd obviously tried to use their car. Um, the people here in, in Ukraine, this, this incredible picture here, you know, people just saying, look, we're going to keep our businesses the open. coffee we'd, shops. We'd that, rather that, just yeah. die, yeah, coffee shops, selling flowers. We would rather die here um, th th than run. And, you know, it just... It, it, it's just absolutely devastating when you when you read these reports. It really is. I think we'd all thought before, hadn't we, that if the war in Europe would be clean and high tech and cyber war, and when you know we'd all been persuaded, and this you realise it, it's dirty and it's devastating, and it absolutely destroys lives. And war is never clean. War, war, war is never pristine in that way. It, it's it's very difficult to cope with. And then the element of how will it end? Mm. Because, you know, a lot of us are going, well, who, who's, who's got the answer to this? Um, and there are so many conflicting reports in, in all of the newspapers. But I, I found this interesting on, on the front of the Sunday Telegraph. It says that Britain's using paid advertising to reach Russian citizens with videos to sort of counteract what they're calling misinformation. And they put out a statement by Boris Johnson. It says, I do not believe this war is in your name. It was viewed by more than 8 million people. Maybe. I mean, I kind of thought that Russia would be the sort of place where they would shut down any attempt by anybody to infiltrate into ordinary people. Maybe this could be the, the modern way of ending warfare, which is to get into the people of Russia and get them to do something about it. Martin, let's talk about uh, cost of living, the Chancellor. Lots of, uh, was a big interview with him today in the Mail. There's also lots about it in the uh, Sun today. Your take? Well, when you read the papers, it's very difficult to know what's happening because you can play them against each other. If I, if I take the sun that I've got here, which says he has a £40 billion war chest uh, to try and... Well, that's a terrible phrasing, I shouldn't use that. He has £40 billion to try and spend on and helping cost of living, but then it has a quote from a source that says, the spring statement will be very policy light. Don't expect him to pull a rabbit out of the hat. Maybe a few baby bunnies, no more. So they're predicting not much will happen. Contrast that to the mail which, I mean, rather bizarrely, and it has to be a typo, it says, has been boosted by a rise in tax, re tax revenues of 12 million. I'm pretty that. sure that, that's 12 billion. Otherwise, we really are in trouble if he's only got 12 million. <laughs> um, but they're predicting, 
I, I find the, the issue of income tax, and I couldn't actually find in the article what they're predicting income tax will be cut. I think they're talking national insurance. And there's certainly an opportunity here. We have the national insurance rise, the 10% rise, or 1.25 percentage points rise that is coming in April. Um, I can't see that not happening. But I do think there is an opportunity to, to increase the bottom threshold of national insurance. Currently, you start paying it at £9,600 equivalent a year. If you were to push that up by 1000 or two, then actually the, the net cost to those on lower incomes, you could get rid of the rise. And I suspect he might be looking to do something now, like that. Now, you're speaking to people all the time. People are getting in yeah. touch with you all the time. And they are very worried, aren't they, about what is coming? I, I've been the money-saving expert since 2000. Um, I've been through the financial crash crash. I've been through COVID, which was mitigated by some of the measures the Chancellor put in place. This is the worst. Where we are right now, this is the worst. When I'm reading messages from people telling me that, you know, money prioritisation used to be, do I, do I go to the hairdressers or do I, do I go to the pub and have a takeaway? Now it's about I'm prioritising feeding my children over feeding myself. That is simply not tenable in our society. Mm. And there is absolute panic and it has not started yet. The, the big drive here is fuel and energy prices. Well, people know about the price at the pumps. But we have to look at the fact on the 1st of April, energy bills are going to go up 54%. That's catastrophic. That's £700 a year. We are now seven weeks through the 26-week period of the assessment for the October price cap. And that seven weeks has been unprecedented at the level of wholesale energy prices, which is what sets that energy price. Now, even on a very conservative estimate, that means in October we're going up another 25%. And while it doesn't sound as big, that's on top of the 54%. So that's at least another £600 a year in October. And how much of this, sorry to interrupt, is yeah. to do with, with what we're going through now at the minute with this sort of whole global unrest and how much of it is to do with various lockdowns? I would say, well, it's, it, it's not, I'm not sure it's either. I think the causes of the cost of living are really difficult. They're structural, they're the recovery from COVID, they're Brexit, they're net zero, they're, they're Ukraine. And none of those are pejorative. I'm not saying any of those are bad. That's just what is knocking onto the fuel price crisis that we have right now. But when you look at the fact that just on energy alone, on a conservative estimate within one year, we're talking £1,300 a year going up in bills, we're going to have about 10 million people in fuel poverty. We have a real absolute, not relative, poverty issue going to come in the UK with food banks oversubscribed, with debt crisis agencies do not have any tools. And I need to say, with the Chancellor coming on in a moment, if you could give me, as the money-saving expert who's been known for this, I am virtually out of tools to help people now. It's not something money management can fix. It's not something for those on the lowest incomes telling them to cut their belts will work. We need political intervention. OK, well, I will be putting that to the Chancellor and you're both going to be joining me later on in the programme for your reflections on that. Right now, though, let's get the latest weather from Louise Lear. Hello, Louise. Hi there, Sophie. Thanks very much. Well, hasn't it been a glorious weekend so far? This was Highland Scotland. Yesterday we saw a high of 20 degrees. It was the warmest day of the year so far and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Today there's a little more cloud around and that's going to be the story actually and just that little bit cooler as well. Temperatures may well just peak at around 14 degrees. Two areas of cloud I need to point out to you. One down into the southwest and this hook of cloud at the moment coming up through the low countries and that may they will just drift towards East Anglia, so Norfolk and Suffolk coast through the afternoon. And both of these areas of cloud have the risk of a few isolated showers. But generally speaking, east of Pennines, a little more cloud as we go through the day. So west will be best for sunshine today. That brisk easterly breeze making those temperatures on exposed east coast only around 9 or 10 Celsius. 13 or 14 is likely to be the high into the west. Now, through the night tonight, we keep that cloud in the southwest and the cloud drifting up through the North Sea will tend to just hug on to that east coast. But sandwiched in between the two, dry, settled, sunny, cold, temperatures just below freezing, so a touch of frost, maybe some mist and fog first thing tomorrow morning, but... It is an improving story as we go through the week. Dry, settled and sunny for all of us, with temperatures once again peaking back into 20s. Sophie. Louise, thank you. 
Now, the Labour Party has accused the government of sitting on its hands over rising energy costs, but would their own plans shield households from higher bills? Ahead of the Chancellor's statement on Wednesday, I'm joined now by the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, something that is affecting people right here, right now, petrol prices. Would Labour cut fuel duty to help motorists? We would definitely support the government if that is what they choose to do this week. But even 5p off fuel duty is only going to be £2 off filling your car up with petrol. I don't think that really cuts it in terms of dealing with the cost of living crisis. This is a historic moment. I speak to mums in my constituency who are saying that they're skipping meals to feed their kids. I'm speaking to pensioners who say we're not turning the heating on, even though we need it on, because I can't afford it. The Chancellor has to show this week that he understands the very real sacrifices that people are having to make right now. So you'd support a you'd it. support a cut of fuel duty. How much how far could he go? Because at the moment it's fifty eight P per litre, isn't it? Well, let's talk about taking 5p um, off. Is that enough? Uh, um, we would support that. I think really, though, what is needed is a windfall tax on the big profits being made by the North Sea oil and gas companies right now and using that money to take money off people's domestic gas and electricity bills because everybody pays the gas and electricity uh, bills and it is the poorest people, people on low and modest incomes, who are experiencing those price rises the most. So my priority would be that windfall tax to keep energy bills low and also uh, not going ahead with this increase in national insurance contributions. We're the only G7 economy that's increasing taxes right in the middle of a cost of living crisis. When price is going up, the government deliberately taking money out of people's purses and wallets, that is the wrong thing to do and we oppose that. Boris Johnson went uh, this week to Saudi Arabia um, hoping that they would produce more oil which would help lower fuel prices. Would Keir Starmer have gone? I don't think it is right to go cap in hand from one dictator to another. And it didn't even yield any um, results. Saudi Arabia didn't uh, do what the Prime Minister uh, said he would do. And also the Prime Minister said that he would talk to the Saudis about their human rights records. Well, on the very day that the Prime Minister was in Saudi Arabia, more people were executed and more have been executed since. I think this shows when it comes to our energy security, we need to do much more to build our own self-sufficiency. But which just, is just to be clear, Keir, so Keir Starmer would not have... I mean, Boris Johnson went there to try and lower, to try and get more oil so that prices would be lower. Keir Starmer would not have done that. Labour would not do that. It's not a tactic that, or not something they would pursue. No, I don't think it is right to go cap in hand from one dictator to another. Surely the lessons from what we're seeing in, in Russia is that we have got to be less reliant on imported uh, oil and gas. We've got to be more self-reliant and not reliant on dictators. And the Prime Minister didn't even succeed uh, this week. Uh, I think in, 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 instead it just shows how impotent we are and how essential it is that we have a proper plan for boosting energy security at home and also actually insulating people's homes because energy bills wouldn't be so high if people had properly insulated homes. That's particularly true for older people and housing in the north of England, which has a poorer record in terms of its insulation. So let's get on with that and take money off people's bills and be less reliant on Saudi Arabia and Russia. Yeah, because last year we bought £862 million worth of crude oil from Saudi Arabia, so if you were in power you wouldn't be doing that either. Well, of course, we would be buying uh, uh, oil from uh, Saudi Arabia, but we've got to wean ourselves off. That, that is the whole point, that we need to be investing in new nuclear. We need to be investing in onshore and offshore wind. There's been an effective moratorium for the last decade on onshore wind, even though it's the cheapest form of electricity. So let's get on and do those things rather than going capping hand to dictators. But you just said, of course, you would be buying oil from Saudi well, we Arabia. We are buying oil from Saudi Arabia so today continue and nobody's doing that. We want to wean ourselves off it. We want to boost domestic production of electricity so we're not reliant on these um, uh, petro states like Saudi Arabia and Russia. We would not be going uh, begging the Saudis for more oil. We want to get off that, uh, partly for energy security, partly for price, and also because getting to net zero is the mission of our generation. We've got to uh, do more to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, which is why investment in homegrown electricity is so important. If the government gives out new licences for drilling in the North Sea uh, this year, are you going to support them? 
I don't think that the answer to a fossil fuel crisis is more fossil fuels. There are better things government could be doing, like ending the moratorium on onshore wind, like getting on with the investment in new nuclear. Um, both Those at, are all very long-term plans, well then, aren't they? They could but, take but a decade so is, to do. Mm, and actually, what we all know mm, is that we have got an energy crisis but now. Sophie, more exploration in the North Sea is also for the long term, because more exploration does not mean uh, more oil coming out of the uh, North Sea tomorrow or the day after. It's years in the making. We know that we, if we get on and invest in onshore and offshore wind and uh, new nuclear, we can do three things at once. We can boost our energy security, keep prices low, and also play our part in the transition to a net zero economy. So and create jobs, you know, and create jobs in this country. And that is really important. Uh, the, the onshore and offshore wind, building those turbines here in Britain, jobs in the nuclear sector, the tidal energy, all of these things could create well-paid, good jobs here in Britain. So there'd be that no be drilling, priority. there'd be no new licences for drilling in the North Sea under Labour? That would not be my priority. My priority would be investing in the new nuclear and renewables that would mean that we could be uh, secure in our energy supplies, keep prices low, create those good jobs here and also play our part in getting to net zero. Something that would help people pay for the rising cost of uh, living is higher wages. The Royal College of Nurses says that nurses deserve an above inflation pay rise of 12.5%, do they? Well, look, those negotiations are gone, going on at the moment, and I'm not going to put myself in the middle of uh, pay negotiations. But it is true that public sector and private sector workers are, at the moment are getting real-term pay cuts. And that's why I, I, I've said, for example, the government shouldn't be doing this national insurance hike. That's going to be more money out of the pay packets of a nurse and a plumber. Whether you work in the public sector or the private sector, these national insurance increases are going to take more money out of your purse and your wallet. It's also why we've said that the government need to tackle the cost of living crisis because the reason why people are understandably asking for more money is that the prices of everything are going up. So if we use that windfall tax on the big profits being made by North Sea oil and gas companies and use that money to redirect it into keeping prices low, then you would tackle the cost of living crisis and you wouldn't need to have such big increases in pay. That's very short term. A windfall tax is a one-off tax. Well, so there's two things, isn't there? First of all, there's a windfall tax to help now. And, and actually, people need help right now. Uh, people can't wait for, you know... the it's the, not the, sustainable, the, is it? A well, windfall the, tax is not yeah, this, sustainable. At, at the Chancellor today says he's a low-tax Chancellor. And yet all he does is keep increasing taxes, 15 Tory tax rises in two years. If the Chancellor wants to show he's a low-tax Chancellor, he should do what Labour says this week, and that is uh, taking VAT of gas and electricity uh, bills and cancelling the national insurance uh, increase. Uh, being in government is about making difficult choices. This Chancellor is choosing to shield the profits being made by North Sea oil and gas companies while increasing taxes on ordinary working people. That is the wrong priority and that's why I so oppose what the Chancellor is doing at the moment. Can I just ask you about the, uh, what the Prime Minister said yesterday in Blackpool, uh, the comparison mm. that he made between Ukrainians fighting Russians like British voting for Brexit? Utterly distasteful and shameless. The people of Ukraine who are fighting for their lives to in any way draw a parallel to voting to leave the European Union, it, it is shameless. And the Prime Minister should withdraw those comments. He was talking about freedom, though, wasn't he? He said that Britons, like Ukrainians, had the instinct to choose freedom. Well, President Zelensky, after the Russian aggression started, applied to join the European Union. He clearly sees no such parallel to the one that the Prime Minister here spoke about yesterday. And the Prime Minister is shameless and he must withdraw his remarks. Rachel Reeves, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, ever since she arrived on our screens as a young Jane Eyre, Ruth Wilson has been a distinctive star in quality drama. She's had standout roles in his dark materials, Luther and The Affair. Her new film, True Things, is based on a novel that she bought the rights to soon after publication several years ago. In it, she plays a woman who has a darkly intense fling with a man she meets while trying to help him find work after a spell in prison. So it usually takes about three to five weeks for a claim to be processed. And if you, you know, don't hear from us within that time, you can just contact us via phone or email. 
Do you have any other questions? What are you doing for lunch? What? Uh... <laughs> I felt like we hadn't sort of seen these kind of stories on screen before. Uh, certainly that time, it was before I May Destroy You, it was before Fleabag, the sort of initial stages of a relationship, which sometimes can feel like infatuation or obsession. Well, I usually just eat a sandwich in the kitchen. They don't give us very long. Sounds worse than bloody prison. <laughs> you want to go out, sit on a bench, well, I will keep that in mind. Thank you. All right. Yeah, you said that she was the most like you that you've ever played. What, what did you mean by that? Lots of my characters, you see me quite formidable or graceful or glamorous, and this felt actually more <laughs> akin to me on an everyday level. But she's very, she's very needy, though, isn't she? I mean, she's caught up in this relationship. It's yeah. an instant attraction, and it's it's almost... I mean, it feels, it feels abusive in many ways. Yeah, I think there's an element that is gaslighting and that he certainly treats her quite badly. Do you have a girlfriend? Are you interrogating me? The director actually always describes it a bit as the sort of Midsummer Night's Dream effect of the kind of magic dust of romance and that you're sort of taken over by this amazing spell and you fall in love with a donkey and then of course the veil lifts and it's a donkey. <laughs> I thought you might have called. I've been busy. You just disappeared. He's got his own things going on um, and that makes him more complex as a character and also makes you understand why she might be interested in him. He also makes her feel good. It's not just as simple as he's a bad boy, it's that actually he makes her feel alive. <laughs> it's explicit in, in a way, in many ways, mm -hmm. your film. It's very, uh, the sex, is nudity, but at the same time, there isn't in a funny story. The way that it's been shot, yeah. you see very little, although you think you see more. I just think you can create really intimate, interesting scenes without actually seeing much. I mean, that's the beauty of cinema. It's the beauty of being creative. Um, you can create amazing chemistry and tell a story um, without showing everything. And we had Harry Woodliff, the fe uh, she's a female writer-director, plus we had a female DP. And actually having that space when you're telling a very female story, it was essential that we had women sort of in those positions. We were being, you know, in a way sometimes more explicit than other shows are, but without showing much. Mm. You're just getting to the truth of what it is to be a woman in those moments. You're about to star in a, a, a play here in, in London, in the yep. West End, um, The Human Voice, Jean Cocteau, which is you on your own, on stage, and a very different setting, as it were. Explain what you're about to do. Yeah, this is a Jean Cocteau piece that was written in 1931, maybe. Um, and it was when phones for the first time were in everyone's home. So people were starting to connect and communicate through phones. And it's really about that relationship this woman has. It's a final conversation with her and her ex-lover. And it's an hour long, and it's me, yeah, talking to this man on the phone. You never hear his voice and it's not actually written. So I've had to kind of imagine what the other side of that conversation is. So it's about the desperate desire to connect, which, <laughs> I mean, lots of us have been confined in our homes for two years, so it feels really quite relevant at the moment. And you're in a box. I'm in a box, yeah. I'm, which I'm basically <laughs> in a box. I still don't quite understand it looks, what well, It looks like the front of an apartment window. So you as an audience will feel quite voyeuristic. You'll be watching me sort of wandering around in my box, talking to myself. Um, <laughs> and you can hear me because I'm mic'd, but you'll be hearing it as if you're through a phone. Wow. So yeah. you can't hear the audience either? I can't hear the audience. And I can't see them. You can't see them? No. So I, I will feel like I'm in my own... I don't know what it will feel like. I haven't done it yet, so we'll see. Are there any parallels between Kate and True Things and the protagonist in this one? I think there are. I hadn't sort of planned that, but I think they're companion pieces in a strange way. They're both about women who are isolated, who are looking for connection. So they're really female stories about relationships and about their own psyche in a relationship, like what it is that they're needing from it. 
And I actually think that's an amazing capacity that humans have is the act of imagination. Ruth Wilson, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Now, on Wednesday, the Chancellor will deliver his spring statement, a mini-budget. The last two were dominated by COVID as he announced huge bailouts to get the country through the pandemic. But now the UK is facing a new crisis as the cost of living spirals. A squeeze on disposable incomes, inflation set to rise above 8% and energy bills could rise to £3,000 a year from October. Will the Chancellor step in? Rishi Sunak joins me now. Good morning. Good morning. Let me start by asking you uh, about Boris Johnson's comments yesterday in Blackpool. The Ukrainians fighting the Russians is like the British voting for Brexit. Would you have made that comparison? Well, I, I, I don't think the Prime Minister was making a direct comparison between these two things. Clearly, they're not directly analogous, and, and that's not what he was saying. He quite clearly did make a comparison. Though they were in the very se same sentence, Britons, like Ukrainians, have the instinct to choose freedom. I've got the entire quote here. They were, he was comparing them to... I'm just I, asking, would you have I think he, made he, that he comparison? Was making, he was making some, some general observations about people's desire for freedom. Clearly, those two situations are not directly analogous. The Prime Minister doesn't think that, they, they, they're, cause, because they're clearly not. Would you have used those words? Would you have directed, would you have compared but, them so directly I think, I think together? So, your point, he, he was not directly comparing those two things. He was talking about freedom in general. Those two situations are not directly comparable. No one thinks that they are. The Prime Minister doesn't think that they are. And actually, with regard to Ukraine, what the Prime Minister has been doing is galvanising global opinion to send a very strong message to Putin that this aggression will not be tolerated. And he deserves enormous credit for that. And it's something that's been praised by the Ukrainians themselves. They recognise the role that the Prime Minister and this country collectively has played in supporting them at this difficult time. And that's the thing that we should be, I think, focused on and proud of. You say that he wasn't comparing them. That's your judgment. But would you have been comfortable saying that, using those two examples in the same sentence? I, I think they're, they're, he's making general observations about freedom with regard to those two situations. And you would have been with that. Neither the Prime Minister nor I think that those things are directly comparable. Let's talk about defence spending. Uh, given the situation in Ukraine, the Foreign Secretary says that uh, you should be spending up to 5% of GDP on defence. Are you planning to do that over this Parliament? Well, with regard to defence, we had something called an integrated review a little while ago, which sets out all the threats facing our country and how best we plan to meet them. And you know, credit to our defence and security services, they highlighted even then that Russia was a significant threat that we faced. And as a result of that, what we did is increase defence spending by a considerable amount, £24 billion over the four-year period. It's the largest increase in defence spending since the end of the Cold War and ensures that not only will we meet our NATO 2% target, we will remain one of the largest defence spenders in NATO overall. I'm glad that we did that and we acted and did that before all of this happened, in, which is a good thing. In real terms, it is falling though, isn't it? Defence spending is falling. It's falling by 0.4% over this part. If you, if you look at the, the figures that were published uh, in the autumn when we last had formal figures published, you'll see that defence spending in real terms grows over that period. Over the whole parliament, yeah, well, not over the, the next three years. No, it's, it's over the period of the, the settlement, which is a four-year settlement. And it's worth bearing in mind, we did that at a time time, actually, all other departments didn't get the certainty of a multi-year settlement, but we knew that it was important that we, we secured defence's future, given the threats that we faced. We had the integrated review, and people should feel confident and reassured that that increase in defence spending, as I said, it's the largest increase in spending, £24 billion pounds in cash over that period, uh, and means that we will be spending more than our NATO 2%, and indeed remain one of the largest defence spenders in NATO it, overall. But it's still in real terms a cut of 0.4%. I've got the figures here. It, but Liz Truss says it's, that... It's going up in real terms over that period, as, as we said it Liz would, Truss close says, to 2% Liz from Truss memory. Liz Truss says you should be thinking about 5% of GDP. I mean, do you not radically need to rethink the amount of money that we spend on defence, given what has happened in Ukraine? I think what, what people will see is that we've, we've invested a lot in defence, as we have in lots of other areas of public services, and I'm sure we'll get on to cost of living and taxes and public spending shortly. Uh, and what people want to see now is they get that we're spending a lot on schools, on hospitals, on defence, on everything else, £150 billion more by the end of this parliament from the beginning. It's a, it's a large amount of money. It's one of the biggest increases over a parliament we've seen in public spending. What people want to see now is that we're getting value for that money, that we're spending it well, uh, that they're working hard, they're sending their taxes over, they want to make sure that we get, as I said, we root out all the waste and inefficiency in the system, we reform things to make sure that their money is being well spent, we've got to focus on delivering that, that's my priority, that's a government's priority for the rest of the parliament. Are energy prices going to keep rising, not just for the next few months, but for the next few years? Well, look, I, I, 
without question, this is people's number one priority at the moment. I get that, and I know how difficult it is when you're working hard and seeing the price of everything go up every day, every week. And the steps that we've taken to sanction Russia are not cost-free for us here at home. And I want to be honest with people that, that you know it's not going to be easy. I, I wish government could solve absolutely every problem that I could fully protect people against all the challenges that uh, lie ahead. Uh, but I can't do that. But what I would say is I will stand by them in the same way that I have done over the past couple of years. People can see that. Where we can make a difference, of course we will. And you saw that with energy in particular. We know the price cap is going up in April. And that's why we acted last month to announce £9 billion worth of support, £350 for most households. That will start to help people in April uh, when the impact of energy bills is, is starting to be felt. You stepped in during COVID. Are you going to step in during the next months, years of rising energy prices and help people with their bills? You know, of, 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 of course I am, and people can judge me by my actions. Over the past two years, you know, where we've been able to make a difference, I've tried to do that. And I've always been honest with people. I, you know, Government can't solve every problem. I wish I could, but I can't, especially when you're dealing with global inflationary forces that are at play. But uh, you saw that on energy prices already. £9 billion of support. It means four out of five households in England are going to receive £150 in direct cash support in April as the energy uh, bills go up and more support on its way in October as well. So there we is are only taking a small action. amount given how high the, the prices are going to rise. You have said that you don't it's want to... It's about half of the increase in the bill in April, which is going up considerably. And, and that's that could why go we up acted. even more in, in October. And, no, we, and we don't know, and I don't want people to be scared. What we have is a price cap that will protect people all the way through to the autumn. Uh, we've acted now to help them with the increase that's coming in in April. Uh, the situation is obviously very volatile in, in You have Ukraine. a good sense already, uh, though. You've got the figures, don't you? You, you know, don't, you, have you, a, don't. you have a you good don't. sense. The way, the way it works is the prices are monitored from uh, the end of uh, from the, from February all the way through to the autumn, and then that sets the price cap in the autumn onwards. So we don't know. We're only a month or so into that period, um, so it's too early to speculate on what it might be. But the signs aren't good. How many people do you think will be in fuel poverty because of rising energy? bills. Well, that's why we've acted, to make a difference to those. And the way that we've done it, in contrast to some of the other suggestions, I know you had Rachel Reeves on earlier, we acted to do things in a slightly more targeted way. So by providing £150 to people immediately in April, that obviously matters more to those on lower incomes with smaller fuel bills than it does to people on higher incomes. And that's a deliberate policy approach to make sure that we get targeted support to those on lower incomes. Uh, we also have a range of other schemes uh, to help people in fuel poverty. For example, one of the things we do every year is invest about a billion pounds to upgrade the energy efficiency of people who are in fuel poverty's homes. That saves them around 300 pounds a year on their energy bill, and that's a, a long-term solution but to this problem. But that's now, and what I wanted to know is how many people you think could fall into fuel poverty because of all this. There are about three million, or there were in 2020, how much is that going to rise? Well, that, I think you we, must the, be looking at those figures. Well, yeah, and the, the actions we've taken, but I think, will make a big difference. But and, how and many people do you think? Are we talking about millions more? And Martin Lewis said it could be eight, ten million people well, could be I, in fuel poverty. Well, I don't, I don't know if he presented any analysis to, to but show that. But you must be doing that analysis. And, you and the must analysis be we've done will show that the, impl the impact of the policies we put in place will disproportionately help those on lower incomes. To give you another thing, we, we so your, your the, actions the are going to stop discount. more people falling into fuel poverty. Is that well, what you're I saying? Think in the actions of this government and previous Conservative governments over the last 10 years have meant that there are fewer people living in poverty today, over a million people fewer living in poverty today. So you're today not expecting a than, rise than in people, are. you're not expecting a number of people well, in fuel I poverty think, to rise? Well, I, I think the things that we're putting in place will make a difference. And it's not just on the energy side where we're helping with bills. We, we are raising the national living wage by 6.6% in April. That's an extra £1,000 for someone on low income. We cut the universal credit taper rate. That's a tax rate on those in the lowest earnings. That, again, for a single mother, that's going to be worth about £1,200. That's not a tax pounds. cut, though, is it? Uh, it's, it's a tax cut in the universal credit Your system. Your own documents say it's not a tax uh, cut. No, no. I mean, well, the, 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 that single mother that I talked about working full-time on the national living measure, wage yeah. is going to be £1,200 better but off a year as a result of that. But you, you can call it what you want. That, that's a measure that is going to help someone considerably to help make sure that they don't end up in poverty and actually that they have the cash they need to get through what is without doubt going to be a challenging what, period. What would help the poorest people, clearly, is what you introduced during the pandemic, the uh, £20 at universal credit uplift. Could you re reintroduce that or would you rule that out? I think uh, what we're doing is taking targeted 
action on the areas where we know there's most acute pressure, for example, on energy bills. And that's why we've put a scheme in place, as I said, £9 billion. It will considerably help people. For people on universal credit, as you mentioned, we've taken an approach to help make sure that their work is rewarded. And, you know, I, of course I want to make sure that we're helping people who are most vulnerable. Uh, by cutting the taper rate in universal credit, we, that's a £2 billion tax cut for those it's on the lowest incomes. It's not a tax cut, it, you, you, we, we can debate it, what it's I'm just called. saying because your own documents it, say it's not no, a tax no, cut. No, actually, it, it doesn't say that, and I describe it as such. But rather than debate the nomenclature of it, why should we focus on the fact that that person is going to be, on average, £1,000 better as off uh, as a result of that policy? That's this government making sure that we provide support to those on the lowest incomes. I'm enormously proud that we're doing that because I want to make sure that those people get uh, our help, and they are getting our help. Let's talk about fuel, because that's what people are feeling right now when they go and fill their, their cars up at the, at the pump. Diesel was £1.76 on average per litre. Petrol was £1.65. Is there anything you can do to stop petrol and fuel prices soaring, diesel prices soaring? Yeah, I know that this is, a big, this is a big issue. It's particularly, I represent a rural constituency where people are very reliant on their cars, as you might imagine. So you feel this particularly acutely at home in North Yorkshire. Uh, and we're all seeing it. It's going up, and it's, it is something that is, uh, you know, is challenging for families. I get that. You know, obviously, I, I, you can't, I can't speculate on, on tax policy. You, you know that, and I know that's frustrating for people. But what I would say on fuel is that we have frozen fuel duty for several years. We froze it again in the budget last year. That will help people. And with regard to energy bills, as I said, we've put in place some intervention that will help there. The Shadow Chancellor said she would support a five pence cut on fuel duty. Is that something that you are looking at? Again, I, I know this is frustrating for you, frustrating for people watching. You know, I'm not able to comment on, on tax policy, particularly in advance uh, of a fiscal event. So, I, but as I said, we're the party that has frozen fuel duty for over a decade because we recognise the importance of people being able to fill their cars up and, and not be prohibitively expensive. We understand that. That's why we've acted for years already on this issue. What about the national insurance, insurance rise that will start hitting people's pay packets very soon? It falls on working people. Do you plan to change that? Could you change thresholds or have you given up on being a tax cutting chancellor? Well, you know, take a step back, we're putting in place a new NHS and social care levy because we care about the NHS. And we were faced with the, I think, uh, unpalatable uh, and unacceptable situation of millions of people having to wait years to get the treatment that they need. And that wasn't OK uh, when we were recovering from coronavirus. And there's a team at the NHS who are prepared to work incredibly hard to help work through that backlog over the next few years. I, I think they deserve and need our support and funding in order to do that. And that's why we put in place this measure. And yes, are there challenges with Ukraine that have come along? There are. That hasn't changed change the underlying situation that there's this backlog and we want to get that funding to the NHS. And what I'd say to people is, uh, I know it's difficult, but you can be reassured that every penny you pay of this levy, unlike any other tax, goes directly to the thing that you care most about, which is the NHS. And thanks to the actions of the Health Secretary, we will make sure that every pound that you send is really well spent. We're doubling the efficiency target for the NHS. That's been announced. The Health Secretary's got a range of plans to, to ensure that we get value for money, can invest more in our but health But you could service. delay it, or you could uh, raise the threshold at which people pay it. Will you be doing that? Again, I, 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 it is difficult for me to talk about a tax policy, but you, you talked about tax cuts and being a tax cutting chancellor. You know, I was also the chancellor that had to contend with a pandemic, which last time we had that was a century ago, the biggest recession in 300 years, borrowing that skyrocketed up to levels that we hadn't seen since World War II, the Chancellor that had to introduce interventions like furlough, all of that cost £400 billion. Uh, and it, we then had to take some difficult decisions to restore the public finances. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, you know, would I prefer not to have had to do that? I would have done. But I do believe they are the right and responsible decisions for the long-term economic security of this country. We've done it in a fair way. Way. And going forward, my priority is to cut tax and put money back in people's pockets. You saw that at the autumn budget. I was very clear about that. And the direction of travel over the rest of the parliament is that. Is turning a blind eye to human rights abuses a price that you're uh, willing to pay for cheaper oil? I think no one is turning a blind eye to human rights abuses. I, I assume you're referring to the Prime Minister's 
trip to the Middle East. It's absolutely right that he engages with our partners and allies around the world as we contemplate how best to ensure energy security for this country. He raised human rights uh, abuses while he was there, but also had very constructive dialogue about how we can work with allies around the world to bring better energy security here at home, and it's right that he's doing that. But he raised human rights abuses with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who was accused of directly authorizing a hit squad to uh, to kill Jamal al Khashoggi with drugs, suffocate him, dismember his body. Is is that something that you're happy to turn a blind eye to in order to make sure that we get lower prices in fuel, that we get more fuel? No, 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 no one no one is turning a blind eye to that. It was very clear and we spoke out again against it at the time and took action with sanctions, uh, as far as I can recall. And, and so I don't think that's right to say that anyone is turning a blind eye to it. But it is also right that we have constructive dialogue with countries around the world. As we've just been talking previously about energy bills and fuel prices, it would be wrong if we weren't exploring all the avenues that we could to bring cheap energy and more secure energy to people in this country and, and while the Prime Minister was there for example he was talking about a billion pound investment that is coming from that region to Teesside up near me to invest in renewable energy to build potentially one of the first sustainable aviation fuel plants that we will have seen so that's the type of dialogue that's happening it's good that we're having that dialogue and it's in the long-term interests of this country that we have better energy security there was a lot of shock this week when PNO dismissed 800 members of staff. Do you regret giving PNO ferries at 50 million pounds of taxpayers' money uh, during COVID now? Well, I think that this what we're seeing is appalling, and the way that they've treated their their workers is awful. Uh, it's wrong, and you know what I can tell you is across government we're examining not just those actions and whether they complied with the regulations as they should have done uh, but also our own relationship with the company and the transport secretaries in the process of reviewing all our commercial relationships with P&O at the moment. DP World uh, is uh, owned, p and Ferries is owned by DP World, it's a Dubai based company. Uh, you have said that you were thrilled that DP World is going to be taking on Thames Freeport, Solent Freeport, that it would be supporting local jobs. Can local people expect to be treated in the same way, fired, hired and then fired? Well, as I said, we're, we're looking across government at our contractual relationships with P&O and reviewing those at the moment. I can't preempt um, the pro that process, but obviously n no one at all is seeing anything other than what happened is appalling and people should not be treated like that. So can you step in and stop DP World operating these free ports? I think the two different things. The P&O ferry situation is something that we're actively looking at, and as I said, we're reviewing all the contracts across government with P&O to determine what the right next steps are. Are you happy for them to keep running these free ports, though? Uh, they're not really, they, are, they already own and operate a port, as far as I'm aware, in the Thames estuary, right? But you, you said at the time you were thrilled and that you were thrilled at the impact it would have on local jobs. Given what has happened at PNO, I'm just wondering whether you're still as happy that this, this is going I, on. I, 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 look, I'm, I'm always happy when people are in work because I think that's one of the most important things that we can do is create the conditions for companies to create jobs for people. We've talked about cost of living and poverty. The best way to help people out of poverty and to tackle the cost of living is to make sure that they are in well-paid work. I spend an enormous amount of my time every hour actually thinking about how can I do that. I'm really glad that because of the actions that we've taken over the past year or two. Unemployment is now back to the levels it was before the crisis. There are record numbers of people in work, record numbers of job vacancies. That is a good thing. So where I can create more jobs in this country or create the conditions for there to be more there jobs. There are that, that, that is of the, people in work though. There, there, there are, are record, record numbers, numbers of people, people on payroll. payroll. That's that is that different is. but that's, that's also you're talking about people. Right, so payroll. There are 600,000 more people on payroll. There are also record job vacancies and unemployment is back at 3.9 percent which is where it was before the pandemic it's it, it's again hard to look at that and say anything other than that is not just a, a fantastic achievement for this country and a tribute to everyone's resilience through the crisis and all the policies that we have put in place to bring about that outcome and that is now helping millions and millions of people do you agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg that the concern over parties, Partygate in Downing Street, is disproportionate fluff that is fundamentally trivial? I, no, I've made my comments on that clear in the past, right, obviously. Not on it, that, you haven't. Do you agree with him I, on no, disproportionate I, no, I have. fluff I've, and I've fundamentally multiple, trivial? I, 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 as I said, 
I've, I've made my points clear about party in the past. Of course, it damaged trust. It was right that the Prime Minister uh, took responsibility for that in the way that he did. He made repeated statements in Parliament from the dispatch box promising changes. Those changes uh, have already started to take impact, and it's right that they have. So you disagree with Jacob Rees-Mogg and his comments. Was he wrong to say disproportionate fluff and fundamental I think it's a, I think pe people were angry and had the right to be angry about what was happening, and I think it damaged trust, but it's also right that that responsibility has been taken and steps are being taken to change things. That has already happened. You were given a questionnaire by the Metropolitan Police. Will you resign if you get a fixed penalty notice? I said I'm not, I'm not going to kind of get into that. I'm fully obviously cooperating with the police. It's right that we let them get on and do their investigation. Um, Let's talk about net zero because sitting alongside your all of this, your commitment to get to net zero by 2050, as part of that, you're asking hundreds of thousands of families to uh, put in heat pumps at a cost of five thousand pounds each. If people are giving three thousand pounds or having to spend three thousand pounds more on their energy every year, how on earth are they going to afford that? Well, so no one, no one is being forced to do that. So that's the first thing to say with regard to, to heat pumps. And I think the second thing is, first of all, our, our track record on this is really good. So as a country, everyone should feel really proud. If you look at since the baselines were set, and I think in 1990, we've reduced our carbon emissions by about 40-odd uh, percent. The rest of the G7 large group of economies have reduced their climate emissions by about five. So we've got a fantastic track record on this. Uh, going forward, we've got a range of investments in new technologies, like offshore wind, for example, um, hydrogen, as we've discussed previously, to make sure that we can make progress towards our net zero targets. But of course, we have to do that in a way that is cognizant of the cost. Uh, we needed to do that anyway, especially now, given where energy prices are. And that's exactly the approach we're taking. It will be pragmatic. It will be measured. It will be focused on improving our energy security here at home. And you'll hear more from the Prime Minister about that shortly. Uh, and that's exactly the right, the right approach. But we've, we've got a great record on this, so people should trust us to, to move forward in, in the appropriate way. Chancellor Rishi Sunak, thank you. Well, let's get some more reaction from what we heard from the Chancellor, from Martin Lewis and Jane Mott, who are still with me. Your reaction? Uh, well, if I focus on energy, as I'm sure the Chancellor will understand me doing, um, he talks about £350 going towards bills. £150 of that is cash. Uh, for anyone who pays council tax in band A to D by direct debit, they'll get it paid into their bank account in April. If you don't pay by direct debit, you can either claim the cash or it'll be given as a rebate. £200 of it is... Well, technically, it's a reverse levy and then a levy on energy bills. I call it a loan, not loan. That will come in October. Now, we did a poll with YouGov on that. 57% of people said they would like to opt out and only 24% of people said they would choose to opt in because this is you get a £200 reduction on your bill this October but then £40 added on, your bill for the on all bills for the next four years. So let's look at the actual amount of cash that is. It's £150 in April. Well, we know in April the typical bill is going up by £700. And then it's £200, which is effectively sort of repairable, that will come in October. We know in October it's likely to go up £600. The Chancellor says we don't know what's happening in October. Well, because we've seen such huge rises in wholesale rates since February, it would take a worldwide massive economic downturn for rates not to be going up in October. And if that happens, we will have other problems. So the vast likelihood is fuel is going up in October. I did try and... Of weather, and it's going to get colder, and people are going to start putting their heat, or wanting you, to put their but heat. But we that over the... I, do, I did listen. I <clears> will stand... He's, I wanted to see if there's any code in there for what's coming out this week. He said, I will stand by them in the same way as I have in the last couple of years. Well, I tell you what, as the Chancellor's outside at the moment, I'm going to take that generously and say... Thank you, Chancellor. We look forward to hearing what that help will be when you make the announcements this week, Are you, because we need help. Are you expecting much more help or not? Because he seems to be quite clear that... I think uh, there needs to be, and I think particularly, you, you know, Martin keeps talking about October, and that is going to be... That a lot of what I heard now is all about the here and now and about April. I hope that behind the scenes they are being proactive about October and what's coming, rather than it's all going to be in October and being reactive again when people are already in, you know, well be below the fuel poverty And yet line. the government has already spent a huge amount of money during furlough, during COVID, to help people. You know, the question is how much longer they can keep doing that. Yes, I mean, I, I, I do have a great deal of sympathy because obviously the dreams of being a low-tax Tory Chancellor are out of the window, really, because of global events 
primarily. And, you know, there is no magic money tree. Uh, and it's all got to come from somewhere, but... We do have 40, up to £40 billion of extra revenue because of the quick because co recovery the on the back of Covid. And because and prices, prices are going up, yeah. so that you get bigger VAT and bigger tax revenue. So there is money somewhere. But ultimately, do we want to be in a country, and again, I say it without hyperbole, where we're going to have those on the lowest incomes in this country genuinely choosing between whether they starve or whether they freeze? I don't want that. I doubt you do. And I've spoken to the Chancellor before and he doesn't. But maybe we need to suck in, our, suck in what we're doing, spending, and he needs to suck in his ideology to we're fix it. We're going to have to lead it there. Martin Lewis, Jim Moore, thank you both very much. And that's all from us for today. Join us again next Sunday. Goodbye.